When I began to take seriously as a teenager of living for the Lord, it wasn't long after that that I began to think about being a preacher of the gospel of Christ. And before I had finished high school, I had decided that to be the course of my life, not knowing whether I could ever preach a lick or not. <laughs> but that was my goal and my desire. And so I set my life to do that. One of the things that crossed my mind was there are things that are to be done, and I want to get them done to the best of my ability. So you have goals that you set, little to education, or to your knowledge of the Bible, or putting into practice what you know, and reminding yourself of it, and so on and so forth. But a lot of the times we come to the end of our days, or even before that, due to maladies or accidents of some sort, we're unable to finish a certain thing that we wanted to finish, that we planned on finishing. And yet there were a host of people, or are a host of people, that are mentioned in the Bible who were never able to finish all that they would have. I don't know what all went on in Noah's mind, but as we think about what we know, if you're a true Bible student for any period of time, about them, you, you think about Noah in various ways, but I think about him uh, stepping off the ark for the first time and, um, and facing a, a, a new world. As you come on down through the Old Testament, I think about Abraham offering his son Isaac. And then as you see the story continuing to develop in the scheme of redemption, you see Joseph who, having been sold to slavery into Egypt, is imprisoned for an evil deed that he did not do. Coming later, you come to King David in Israel. And following the killing of King Saul and his son Jonathan, and Jonathan and David were extremely close personal friends. I see the lament of David over Saul and Jonathan. There is then when Absalom rebels his own son against David and Absalom is killed and you see the great bereavement and heartbroken state of David over his son. But then there comes to mind also Job who had such greatness and was by God considered a man that loved the truth and lived it and hated evil. And we see him in sackcloth and in ashes, and covered in boils. And his prosperity is taken from him and he's in ruins. When you come over to the New Testament, you find Jesus teaching the multitudes and they followed him to hear the master teach. And yet when he taught on how he was the bread of life, the scripture says many went back and followed him no more. And then Judas, who had been with all the other apostles all those three or more years that the Lord had his earthly ministry, and yet he turned out one who betrayed him. The apostle Peter alone on the outside while Christ had been arrested and was being tried and put through his ordeal before the crucifixion has come to grips with his own weakness of the faith and he's weeping because of his sin and having denied the Christ and then Christ himself on the cross and as ignoble and shameful and painful of death man can inflict upon man. And he's between two terrible thieves. And he's all alone. Nobody can do what Christ can do. So he has to do it by himself. And then one of the great persecutors of the church, Saul of Tarsus. With authority from the chief priests and elders in Jerusalem to go to Damascus and arrest Christians. 
ends up being called by Christ to be an apostle. Then, of course, he obeyed the gospel through the teaching of Ananias, whom Jesus sent to him to tell him what he must do. But then many years later, after he's the apostle Paul and done so great, great things for the Lord, you see that Paul soon to die. He's alone. Luke is there in a Roman prison. There are so many things about the people of the Bible that we don't focus on. We, we tend not to think about these. I think of Paul, too, because in writing the Roman letter, he said, I'll stop by there when I go on to Spain. Well, I don't know whether he ever got to Spain or not. If history's right, he was arrested, tried, let loose for a little while, then arrested again, and then he was killed. That would be the time before his death that he wrote the epistle to Timothy. But scenes like these are recorded in our minds. They're there for a reason. Paul didn't just want, or rather the Lord didn't just want to tell us these things as a matter of history. Because I know everything in the divine volume is to teach me. To help me along the road to heaven. Walking the straight and narrow way. Restricted by the truth of God. And I want to take you back now with all those things in mind. To Deuteronomy chapter 34 and verse number 4. This is the last chapter of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is a restatement of the law by Moses to the children of Israel before Joshua takes over and leads them into the conquest of the land of Canaan after their 40 years of wandering. And in verse 4, Moses said, And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. Well, there was a reason he wouldn't go, and that's because he himself had sinned. And the second time to give water to the complaining, murmuring, fickle Israelites he was to speak to a rock, though it would give water, but he struck the rock as he had the first time. And thus, God would not let him go over into that land. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. Talk about unfinished business. Talk about long, in-detail plans and privation and work, yet he was not able to go over. He planned that, but there's un finished business you know he's 80 years old when he leaves leading the children of Israel out of bondage to Egypt and crossing the Red Sea and he spends 40 years dealing with this bunch of fickle people and they're so sinful then God leads them in that wilderness for 40 years until all those 20 years old and upward save Joshua and Caleb are dead and that's because of their sins there are many things here, but one of the things is, as great a man as Moses was, sin, sin for anybody. It's the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. So Moses there, standing on Mount Nebo, overlooking the land of Canaan. That's somewhat of a pathetic sight after all those years when you see that. And yet I suggest to you that a great many of us... Uh, will come to the end of our days, maybe right at death, and then maybe earlier due to illness or infirmities of age or whatever. And we will not be able to finish out purposed and planned things. Because we're always talking about doing something, planning this and planning that. You know, James dealt with that with Christians concerning even planning to go into another place and carry out business. He said, you don't do that without saying, if the Lord will, we'll do such and so. And God's hand is in it all. And I speak especially here this morning to those who are Christians, as the Bible defines and uses the word Christian. Because we can have all of our plans. They can be good plans. Even as I said, Paul planned to go to Spain as he went by Rome. He would stop and see those folks, but there's no record that he ever was able to do that. But if you know the character, and we do, of, of Paul the Apostle, 
uh, he would have gone till he couldn't go anymore. And of course, that time came for him to cease his earthly labors. And he would say to Timothy, the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid for me a crown of righteousness, but not to me only, but to all those who love his appearing. But what do we do when we have plans and it dawns on us? I wanted to do that so much, but I can't. I can't do it. So the closing scene of Moses' life on the mountain in the land of Moab reminds us then concerning a number of things as to living our own lives. So I want to discuss that this morning with these Old Testament backgrounds and New Testament in the background of, of the purposes that are unfinished in our lives. First of all, the high purposes of life are really seldom attained. We accomplish things. I don't mean that. Paul said, I fought the good fight of faith. He said, I finished my course. But I know he had other things he wanted to do. They were right and wholesome things. They were good for the kingdom. They were in harmony with his work as an apostle and as an evangelist. So Moses then is not the only one who failed to reach the land of promise as far as what it was to him and to the Israelites, the land of Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey that had been in their minds from the time of Abraham and God making that original promise to him in Genesis chapter 12. But look at Abraham. Faithful Abraham, selected by the Holy Spirit, is the epitome of what it is to be faithful to God. He did not live to see the fulfillment of the divine promise. He served God faithfully. If you read Hebrews 11, where the inspired writer writing part of the New Testament gives us examples of great faithfulness, look at what he says about Abraham. Go over to James 2 and look at what the Holy Spirit through James said about Abraham, all those written to strengthen us. But then there's also King David. We think of him as the sweet singer of Israel. He wanted to build the temple. God said no. You've been involved in too many wars and you've been involved in too much shedding of blood. So he planned the temple. He got it all together, but he was not allowed to build it. If you read on through the time of the kings, there was the, after great apostasy, the young king Josiah who was certainly the hope of the faithful Jews. And they were very much of a forlorn people at that time. And yet, he slain in a great battle in the plains of Esdraelon. And I've already mentioned the Apostle Paul. He did not see the fruition of his labors. You can go on even into secular history and see all sorts of things where great men, as far as the way the world measures greatness, had great plans and they did great things, but they didn't finish at all what they wanted to do. I think of the great composer Schubert, who didn't finish a symphony he was writing, and it's simply known as the Unfinished Symphony. It's interesting to read about some writers and others who produced a number of works and yet when they die, people are going through family, maybe through their particular belongings, and they find various things started or planned or involved in doing them, but they're unfinished. Life ended on this earth. The affairs here must terminate. That ought to help us as Christians to not try to order things as if it all must be done here. It all must be finished here. doesn't mean we shouldn't order our lives. That's not the point. But we are pilgrims. We're just traveling through. And that's trying to say you cannot plan everything to be done here. So for each of us, life is really an, an interrupted journey, interrupted story, an, an, an unfinished symphony. Do we ever reach the climax of our life? Is our task ever completely done on this earth serving 
God. A year slips into eternity. And we have all kinds of resolutions in our mind that we plan to do, but they're unfulfilled. Now, I'm not talking about simply not doing what God requires of you. I'm talking about planned out things that are good and wholesome, but life terminates and we can't finish them. We die before attaining perfection. Think about that for a minute. No matter how faithful you are right now, or you will be before you die, no matter how much love you have for God, how much dedication you have to Him, perfection, flawlessness, sinlessness is not in this life. Remember, John says, if you say that you don't have any sin, you're a liar and the truth's not in you. Now, God has a system, the gospel system, that when you obey the gospel, your past sins are remitted by the blood of Christ, which is a believing, penitent person. You're baptized into Christ for the remission of past sins. Now you're set up on a course of faithfulness, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, to where the blood continues to cleanse, 1 John 1, 7. I understand that. But in this life, you cannot be as you will be in the resurrection after the judgment in heaven. It's an impossibility. You cannot do it. So the most faithful child of God cannot reach that kind of perfection in this life. It can't be found here. So we leave this life, and therefore we leave a battlefield. And it's been said many times, we lay our armor down only when we're through using it in this life. Everything's called to a halt. And it's time for us to leave. Now, in the great mind of the Almighty, He knows when that's going to happen. He knows when it's time for me to leave here. He knows, of course, exactly how I'll leave here. And so with you and each one of us, because there's nothing unknown to Him. If it's knowable, it's from Him. It's in His mind. Now, that's the first point. There are purposes, high purposes of life that are really seldom attained or fully attained. And again, let me remind you, I'm not talking about not attaining salvation. I'm talking about working as a member of the Lord's church, no matter how faithful you are. There are plans that you have. Now, I think one of the saddest things, before I go to the next point, is the person who lives to a certain age and says, well, I've done all I could, I quit. I think a person ought to be, as long as he's able to function, he ought to be planning things to do for the Lord. How can a person be a member of the Lord's spiritual body, added to the Lord, the church, by the Lord himself, and not be planning to do great things for the Lord? Now, great things is simply doing what you can where you are, like the Lord said, do it, obeying his will. Someday that'll stop. In the fall of 1991, there was a lectureship over in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And Brother Foy Smith was scheduled to speak. He was being introduced by somebody standing as I'm now standing. He was sitting here. He had his Bible. Now I'm sure he planned and studied and had his lesson ready. But just as the person was introducing him, he said, now let's hear Brother Foy Smith. He slumped down. Bible fell on the floor, and he was dead of a massive heart attack. Never moved again. All those plans and purposes, right and wholesome plans and purposes, efforts to get there and to do it, it all ended. I had a friend of mine whose grandfather was a member of the church and faithful as far as anybody knew. And at the end of the service one day, they called on him to lead the closing prayer. And when they called on him, there was silence. As we do sometimes, we wonder, well, did he hear? And he looked. He was slumped down in his seat. He had died too. We do not know. However, in both those instances, that suits me fine to go that way. <laughs> Somebody said he could finish his prayer in person. But you see, those things are going to happen to us. I suggest to you we don't think about those things like we ought to. But all my life from a teenager 
started to preach, I've tried to impress that on people. And I found that uh, most of us are, we're going to do it all here. We're going to make our plans. We're going to accomplish all here. But you won't. And the Bible's full of material pointing out how many things change. The next point is that a life is a, life is a link. Now get that. The li one's life is a link in the chain of God's eternal purpose. Someone told me when we had the debate, and I'm not saying he was correct on it, but he told me this, when we had the debate with the Roman Catholics. He said, you'll never live to see the good done in that debate. Well, I, I, I'd preach that for years too. If there was any good done, I hope it is. But I know what he meant. Because we don't see all of the good that we do. I might say also, people who are evil people don't see all of the results or consequences of the evil they do either. That's the reason there has to be an end to a place where good and evil are done, and it can't be done there anymore before there can be a final and complete judgment. In the leading of the children of Israel from the land of Egypt into Canaan, it wasn't only Moses that was chosen by God, but also Aaron and Joshua, and there were others. And if you even study secular history, you will see that in great movements over history or in different places in the world, there have been many personalities and many plans made by them and executing it to accomplish what they wanted to do, but yet it ends and they don't finish what they wanted to do and somebody else takes over. And I think one of the greatest things we can do in the church though I don't know that we understand this fully yet, is to be preparing the people to follow behind us. I heard Brother G.K. Wallace say this a long time ago. He said the greatest thing that parents can do is to rear their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and all that means so that when, their parents are, when those parents are no longer there, those children will go ahead and live the right kind of life. Now, I know that uh, children uh, have the power to choose right or wrong. And even when you have the Father being God, that doesn't mean that Adam and Eve won't transgress the will of God. So I know there's no guarantee, no matter how godly you are as parents and great example in teaching, that that's going to guarantee your children will always be faithful. But you do what you're supposed to do is the idea. And that's what all of us need to be doing. But again, coming back to the fact we're to live lives and teach the truth and train our children so that when we're dead and gone, they will have the wherewithal to move on. You have that in the parable of the prodigal son. He willingly rejected what he should have, as we would say, hung on to. When he left home, demanded his inheritance, wasted it in riotous living, ends up down the hog pen desiring the food the hogs are eating. It was only then that he came to his senses, but he could do this. And that tells me what, he was, what was done at home before he left. He remembered what he'd been taught. He remembered how he'd been trained. He remembered how his godly household had functioned. And he said, I'll just go back and say, I'll just be glad to be here as one of the hired servants. And he found out then when he returned in repentance just how much he was cherished and treasured. For the father saw him coming afar off and went to meet him. But nevertheless, we have to have the wherewithal to do that kind of thinking and remembering and the integrity of heart to when we remember it, to act upon it. And that's our responsibility. So each person, each man, each woman plays a humble but necessary part but it's not all beginning and ending with me or you. It didn't in anything we read of in the scriptures. And so it won't with us. Like a link in a chain, a life is worthless when it stands alone. That's one thing we didn't understand about New Testament fellowship among the brothers and sisters in the family of God. Each one of us are links. And hooked together we share in the whole thing pertaining 
to the working of the kingdom and the worship of God. It's only when one life fits into other lives, supporting the all-important purpose of the eternal, that it makes a worthwhile thing. We're just simply not workers alone. But as Paul said, we're workers together with God. I don't know that we think that much about that. Workers with one another, the Lord added us all to the same church. We're born of water and the Spirit. We're new creatures in Christ. We're all in the family of God. But yet in that family, we work with God. We're actually to carry on as the Lord's spiritual body, the church, the very work that Jesus came to do. He's the head of the church, the only head, and his will is given to us in the last will and testament of Jesus Christ, and we willingly submit to it, and the work of God on earth goes on. And it cannot go on unless we do our part. And we do our part when we not just carry on where we are in our individual life, but with the reality that we impact others who will be here when we're long gone. I benefit daily from things that people did and wrote that have been dead a long, long time. Sermons left behind, commentaries written, questions answered. And now I'm old enough to remember things taught me by people who have been dead a long time now. So I stand on their shoulders, and so do you. It's a ridiculous thing and absurd to say, well, I stand here all by myself. I don't have anybody to thank for anything. I just did it all myself. That's ridiculous I'm so thankful for all the people that went before and were faithful and in the area of being a gospel preacher so thankful that I had all those who went before and were faithful that helped me some personally some through their writings and in that way they still do the next point is that as we play our part and step aside and I've already introduced this others step into our labors you remember that after Moses was buried in the land of Moab Joshua took over he entered into the very labors that Moses had been involved his predecessor Moses had left now was the work of the Lord the end no not at all and I said earlier but I said again that Jesus Jesus of Nazareth, our Lord, our Savior, labored, and then after he is resurrected, ascends to heaven. Others take up his labor. Who is that? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And we're taught to convey these thoughts, these ideas, the will of Christ to others. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2. And if we attain heights never reached by those who preceded us, this is what I've seen so many, even preachers, forget. We need to remember we're standing on their shoulders. I just wonder how much it crossed the Apostle Paul's mind to realize that he's the reason, as the Apostle of Christ to the Gentiles, that the whole Gentile world, those all who hear and obey the gospel and live faithful, owe their salvation to the great labors of this wonderful servant of God. So let no man think too highly of his own achievements or speak even disparagingly of the efforts of those who went before him because we build on those. I've noticed that those who want to depart from the inspired pattern of Christianity, who want to apostatize and leave the doctrine of Christ, one of the things they start doing, and I've experienced this throughout my life, is they disparage the older preachers and older folks and call them old mossbacks and all that kind of thing. But when people have lived their lives faithful to God, they set an example that I ought to perpetuate. If I can learn more than they learn, fine. I know this about my parents. They wanted the best for me. They were imperfect because all people are. But they wanted their best for me. 
And I don't know of parents that love their children that do not want the best, letting the Bible define what is best, that do not want the best for their children. Oftentimes I hear people say, well, my parents were not members of a church. They didn't believe you have to be baptized as a believer who's repented in order to be saved from your past sins. I just can't obey the gospel because of that. Did your parents want you to have better than they had? I can tell you right now from if I have nothing else to go on but the account that Luke gives us in Luke 16 of the death of Lazarus the beggar and the rich man that anybody that is lost anybody that is lost does not want to see their family members coming to where they are you remember that the rich man said to Abraham looking across the great gulf of the Hadean world There where Abraham was in paradise with Lazarus being comforted. But the rich man's tormented in that flame. When he finds out Lazarus cannot be sent across that great gulf. For nobody can come from Abraham in paradise to where the rich man was in torment or vice versa. He then immediately turns and says, I have five brethren that are back on the earth. Send Lazarus back from the dead that he can testify unto them not to come to this place. I don't know how wicked those brethren were, but I know he knew by their actions they were not living like the law of Moses taught those Jews to live, and they were coming right to where he went. He didn't want them there. When people today say, my parents didn't know the plan of salvation, and they loved me and all this kind of thing, I can tell you right now, if you want to heap misery upon misery, if such is possible, then let them see you coming into torment when you had the opportunity they didn't have. I can think of nothing that would heap more pain and anguish on somebody in torment than to see their dearly beloved children coming to be with them forever. We go further. When God goes about to weigh a life, He places the motive, not the accomplishment, in the balance. I don't think we think enough about that. The motive is placed in the balance. Now, if you take the life of Moses and you look at his life from the standpoint of the way the world measures success, I think you have to pronounce him a failure. Canaan, which was the land of his dream, was denied him. But if you weigh the motive of Moses, then he's one of the greatest men of all time, and that's what the Bible does. The contemporaries of Jesus, and there were were a host of them, must have considered the life of Jesus Christ, that little country off in the far southeast part of the Roman Empire. It wasn't thought much by anybody, even the People sent to rule it by the Romans thought they were being put in a bad place. They must have thought of the God-man to be a tragic failure. Well, was that really the case? Why, he was the greatest success there was, of which there's no greater. The lofty ideal that set out in the life of Christ, of which we read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, His benevolence, his love, his sacrifice, his pattern of living set for you and for me. As Peter said, he's left us an example that we should walk in his steps. You can't get any more of a success or be any more success than that. And we who are members of his spiritual body, shouldn't we take that to heart? It is our fidelity to a great principle. Not our visible or material success that wins divine approval. Which is, at the judgment, well done, thou good and faithful servant. 
I'm quite persuaded there'll be a multitude of people there that for the way we look things, even in the church as to who's great and who's not in service to God, there'll be a lot of folks like Dorcas who accomplished so much but did it quietly, silently, in the area of her sphere of work who will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Remember, we're not saying you don't act according to the authority of Christ. We're saying when you do act according to the authority of Christ, and we must, Colossians 3.17, the motive is weighed in the balances. What did we really desire to do and to accomplish? We can try our best to do something and never maybe accomplish the plans and purposes of it. But yet it's what we were trying to do. It's what we were laboring to do. It's what we were faithful over. And in the last great day, the great judge will weigh us by our motive. The last point I want to make is that the highest aspiration of a soul can be halted but only for a season. Now, you may not have noticed it, and Gary didn't know about that, I don't think. But some of the songs we just participated in is making that very clear. Because we have the hope of eternal life. That's where all will be brought to bear and finished and completed. When the door of Canaan was closed, what happened with Moses? Why, he entered the spirit world where he found a blessedness that Canaan could not give him, Matthew 17, 1 through 3. And then there's Stephen, first Christian martyr. Stoned because he loved men and he preached to them the gospel. He did not mince words, but told them the truth. And when the door of his existence in the flesh on earth came to an abrupt end, why don't you know that he passed into a better country? As is said in Acts 7, where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest. Again, I remind you of Paul. I didn't mention this earlier, but he planned and purposed to go preach the gospel in Bithynia. But the Holy Spirit said, you're not going there. That's not the way I want you to go. So that door was closed. But then he moves into the Gentile world and the doors opened in Macedonia which was a far more fertile field. There he gathered such a, shall we say, a golden harvest, Acts 16. One of the things in God's great providence for his faithful children and underscore his faithful children is that when one door is closed, many times more doors open. We just need to be faithful and let God take care of his part. So let's not despair or be greatly dismayed at the reversal of our own little plans. And they are little many times. They may not seem that to us. And our motive may be, as I said, as pure as it can be and planned out to do a great thing, but the door may be shut. There's no real defeat for the soul that is devoted to a noble purpose. And do you know of a more noble purpose than to serve Christ faithfully all the days of your life? Those things which appear to be against us, God can use to help us, to make us, make us more worthwhile to the kingdom, Romans 8, 28. We close the lesson by making this clear. To men of this world, death spells defeat. It's eternal and irrevocable defeat. But Jesus is saying to the faithful in Christ, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I have conquered the grave. I've conquered death. I've given you the victory. There's a brighter, better world. And it's this thought that makes life bearable, it makes whatever burdens come upon us lighter. And thus, as Paul said, when they were involved in that great shipwreck just before it happened, 
we thanked God and took courage. Paul had no idea of how he was going to get to Rome. And he was in prison some three years before he ever took the journey that ended the way it did. But if we're just faithful to the truth that we know right now, make all of the plans you want and make them well to do decent in order whatever God charges us to do. But no, we may not go that route. That door may be shut. But there will be another door open. He can use us according to our several abilities and dedication. And thus we purpose with a whole heart to serve him until the day heaven is our home. If you need to obey the gospel of Christ, we urge you to do that now. As a child of God, if you sin, we urge you to repent of those sins and confess them. That we might be as close to God as we possibly can and serving faithfully until life on earth terminates in eternity. For we invite you now to do that, to obey the gospel, if you need, while we stand and while we sing.